reverend and most beloved in Christ, I, unworthy child of the Saxon race, who am in comparison with those my countrymen, not only in years, but in virtue also, only a poor little creature, I had made up my mind to address you, religious and Catholic men, a few words on the beginning of the early life of the venerable man, Willibald. In the year 725 AD, a young Bavarian bishop named Willibald makes a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, over here. During this pilgrimage, he visits most, if not all, of the sites that have to do with Jesus and the Gospels. Now think about it. If only he took the time to write down what he saw, keep kind of a travel journal, and if we had that journal today, we would be able to read about sites that no longer exist, that have been destroyed long since the 8th century. Unfortunately, he did not keep such a record. But, luckily for us, right before he died, someone interviewed him and wrote down what he saw. If I may say so, it seemed to me to be shameful that a human tongue should keep all these things in the obstinacy of a dumb silence with sealed lips. So we listened and determined to write from the dictation of his own mouth, two deacons being present and listening with me on the night day before the calends of July, the day before the solstice. This is the work of a young English nun named Roswitha, who took the initiative to write down the itinerary of Willibald's pilgrimage in the 8th century. And here's where it gets really interesting. According to this document, Willibald travels to the Lake of Galilee and visits the regular touristic places like Tiberias, Magdala, Capernaum, and then comes to Bethsaida. And in Bethsaida, he visits a church that he says was built on top of the house of apostles Peter and Andrew. And this is what we call today the Church of the Apostles. And here's the big problem. Willibald's account is the only known written record where this church had been explicitly mentioned. Perhaps shortly after his visit, it was destroyed, sunk in the Galilean Sea. Or some have even suggested that this church never existed. Maybe Willibald was confused. Maybe the nun who wrote it down made a mistake. Whatever the reason is, we know that the Church of the Apostles has vanished. It was lost for generations. Until today. Go. That's incredible. Look how much they excavated. Wow. This is incredible. It is awesome. Since last time we were here, the amount of digging they done and how deep they went down to the layers and the years. It is remarkable. I believe this is gonna be a big sight. Good to see you. I would, I would do the Middle Eastern kiss, but it's gross. <laughs> So Moti and I are in dispute because he thinks it might be the screen of the gallery of the church. So we've actually been to this place before, one year ago, and we filmed an episode about this place being the real Bethsaida. 
In comparison to the previously thought location to be Bethsaida, which is located two kilometers away from this one, away from the shore. And back then that was one of the main reasons why this place would be a much better candidate for being Bethsaida. Bethsaida was a fishing village, this one is closer to the shore, this must have been it. But since we filmed one year ago, the archaeological team dug out a ton of new evidence supporting this to be the real location of Bethsaida. So they think they found something huge in there, he could feel the vibration from the handle. Uh, that there's a big metal piece in there. And you can watch our previous Bethsaida episode to learn more about it. So why are we filming another episode here? Well, because on top of confirming that this is the real Bethsaida, they found here the lost church of the apostles. This is the very church that Willibald traveled to in the 8th century. We think that this is uh, inside of the church. There's a tradition of the church built over the house of Peter and Andrew. Uh -huh. Most people thought the, the church didn't exist. <laughs> so we talked to various scholars and said, oh no, they were mistaken. The church that they're talking about is over in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. so he says, but say this, ah, they were mistaken. Now, we know he wasn't mistaken. Many people have claimed that this church did not exist. And yet, here we are, standing here today, looking at its mosaic floor, touching the artifacts that are found from this church. Once again, the written record of the ancient past has been proven right. This is a really nice piece here. Marble? Yes, this is from the chancel screen and the, to separate the congregation from the area of the altar. Oh, that's yeah, yeah. Amazing. Here's a roof roller, a portion of a roof roller that was found there. These are for the re re-sealing of the roofs. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to roll them and yeah. uh, re put mud on them and uh, plaster. Just little They're little pieces. One was very interesting because it had a, it was a piece that had a very nice cross on it. What was it? Is it? Uh... It's a Byzantine uh, vessel and it had a, uh, but a very nice Byzantine cross uh -huh. uh, inset into it. So today is actually the last day of the excavations this season. So all of the artifacts they found in the past few months have been already taken away for preservation, analysis, restoration. What we see here today is just what they found in the past few days and also in front of our eyes. Yet all of this evidence is pointing that this is the real site of Bethsaida and this is the Church of the Apostles. Everything we're finding is, every day, the argument gets stronger and stronger. Um, you know, we're preparing, we're coming to the point where we say, there's no question now. Wow. The question mark is finished, we're, we're on the side of Bethsaida Julius. When we were here last time, they only excavated a few squares. At that time, the size of the village was not yet known. But today, they've extended the excavation by a hundred meters. It looks to me, it's, it's a huge site. I mean, there's, it's all the way there, this expanded that's, so much. That's the other part of it, is that we opened up what we call Area C, uh -huh. 100 meters away to the north, and it uh, immediately, we're in the Roman level. Last year when we were here, we thought it was just a couple of buildings, a small ancient bathhouse, that's about it. But seeing how far they've extended the dig today, it is mind-blowing. Coins, all the pottery, everything coming out of here points to Roman period. Um, more than that, this is where they found the Herodian lamps that are distinctive to made in Jerusalem pre-70, together with Jewish uh, soft limestone vessels, which is part of the developing concern in the Second Temple period, period for uh, ritual purity. So you have these stone vessels. Those are distinctive markers for uh, Jewish settlement. So what are stone vessels? They are food vessels made out of stone. Unlike clay and pottery that is used all over the world at that time, the Jews used stone. Why? Because they figured it can get defiled. Right? And then they don't have to break it like with a clay. Right. It's actually a fascinating study and we have an episode about it with Dr. Adler who excavated the stone quarry in Nazareth. So check it out. So this site is located inside a national park at the shore of the Lake of Galilee at the mouth of the Jordan River. 
it is very exciting to think about the future of this place. This can become an incredible tourist site in Galilee. These are gilded in gold and that tells us that it wasn't on the floor, but it belonged to a magnificent mosaic, gold mosaic on a wall. These only belong to beautifully ornamented churches. So it, it's further evidence that we have a church waiting for us under the ground. The excavations here had only begun. Because at the end of the season, the team performed electromagnetic ground scans. The scans show that there are numerous structures under the surface in between the two areas that they've already excavated. That is 300 feet of still unexplored streets, buildings, and maybe some other surprises, all to be revealed in the future digs. Yet I am but a woman, tainted with the frailty of my gender, with no pretensions to wisdom or cleverness to support me, but prompted solely by the violence of my own will, like a little ignorant child, plucking a few flowers here and there from numerous branches rich in foliage and in fruit. So I pluck twigs from the lowest branches with what small skill I possess and offer these few things to serve you as a memorial. It is incredible to think about the bravery of one man who took a dangerous journey and a will of one woman who, despite not being held in high esteem by her peers, she considered it an honor to write these things down a loving offering to us and a joyful praise to God. All these things on the white surface of the fields of paper I have plowed with my pen and left four tracks written in black ink, which are now offered to your loving knowledge. Against all the censors of the envious, God's grace and yours will be the shield of our protection, and yet we calmly commend them to your acceptance so that in all things we may joyfully praise our Lord, our Deliverer, and the Giver of all good gifts. This is it for today. We hope you enjoyed this update on Bethsaida. Please subscribe below. And put the notification button on. Yeah. And please subscribe below and turn that notification uh, thingy on so you can get all our future videos. Please subscribe below and turn on notifications so that you may get notified when we release the next episode with new findings from this site. Subscribe. Should we do another take? <laughs>